responsive design is like uh, one of these big buzzwords these times. And it's not like we have written or read a lot of books about responsive design. I want to talk about the theory. We just did it. And uh, I really mean it, just did it. Um, and we learned a lot with it, as you can imagine. And this is what Sabine wants to share with us tonight. So welcome, Sabine. Yay. You're awesome. Thanks for coming. Um, Andreas actually just saw my introduction. I think responsive design is a huge um, buzzword. I think I don't have to explain what it is um, because you are all experts. You know that. Um, but I'd like to share some um, experiences we had last year during a really huge project um, uh, where we did responsive design. Um, and um, yeah, I want to share some of the outcomes, um, how we adapted our processes, because you have these um, responsive design evangelists um, saying, if you want to do responsive design, you have to do it like this. Um, Sometimes it works, sometimes you would have to adapt it um, because it didn't really fit our processes. So, um, yeah, I'd like to share how we did it. Um, and also, um, I'd like you, um, in the end, to share your experiences because I'd be really um, curious to know if that, what I, what I say, if, if you agree or if you say, like, no, we did it differently. Um, that's all, yeah, very cool to hear. So, yeah, we'll see. Um, maybe you just show me a quick hands, like, who has... Um, like, who has worked on responsive projects before? Okay. What was it? Who, who has never um, worked on a responsive project himself? Okay, so, yeah. <laughs> Good. Okay, so there's um, something to learn here. <laughs> Good, so um, I'd like to start by this little quote by um, John Maida. Um, it's actually not a quote, it's a haiku. You might have noticed that. Um, it says, all I want to be is someone that makes new things and thinks about them. And I can totally put my name under, under this because, um, yeah, I, I totally like to do new things like responsive design and then kind of take a step back and um, reflect on it and see, um, yeah, how it connects to the, to the bigger picture out there and to what everybody says out there in the blogs and magazines. So, yeah, that's why I am holding this presentation today, basically. Okay, so, um, you can see here um, one of the websites that has taken the uh, responsive approach. It's called uh, Skinny Ties. It's basically a tie shop, and um, it's really a cool example, I think. Um, they have um, a, a written a good, uh, a good case study about it, so um, you might want to take a look. Um, and they took the um, responsive approach for the website and it, it worked really well. And but before we started our project, we had a look at like what are the responsive projects out there, how did they do it, um, what was their process, what did they share. And we found out that most projects that we found um, were like really small websites or like not really complex websites that um, took the responsive approach. And we said, okay, what, what we're doing right now is a little bigger because um, I can't, um, we're doing a complete relaunch of a corporate website of a German media company. They said they want like tear down the, the old website, like start from scratch, build it new, and build a new flagship store for us. And we said, okay, cool. <laughs> So um, this flagship store, it sh um, should not only contain, of course, the, the product information and the checkout, but also the self-care area, all the product descriptions. It should contain a whole media center with uh, videos and pictures. And yeah, of course, it should convey all the brand experience. Um, we want magazine pages in there. We want news pages in there. We want it all, basically. So it should not only you know, be the the great brand experience, but also sell, and it should work on mobile, so, hello, challenge. <laughs> um, I can't reveal uh, the client, so I can't tell you um, or show you any, any concrete deliverables, but, um, yeah, I, I talk about the process and how we did it. So, what was our project setup? There's a picture of you. <laughs> um, 
So that was basically our like our basic um, um, process um, or project setup. We were a, a fairly large creative team. We were seven information architects and five visual designers, and we tried to count the uh, the client stakeholders that we were talking to, and we came nearly a hundred. <laughs> um, so there were a lot of people involved in this project. We worked on it from July to December uh, last year, and we worked in three phases. Um, so the first one was our discover phase, where we did workshops with the client and stakeholder interviews and tried to gather all the high-level requirements, um, which led into a defined phase where we said, okay, what's our basic uh, concept, what's our vision, um, getting this aligned <laughs> with the client, um, getting the basic design direction done, um, do a first user test to see how it works, and sort of get the basic idea um, of, the, of the new flagship store, right? And then move into a deliver phase, which is actually, which was really high paced. Um, we worked in a batch process, which meant that we had two weeks, uh, two week batches um, for each work package. So within one week, we had to finish the information architecture for a work package and the and another week the visual design, and then the next work package. So it was um, really a very high paced um, process that we had here. Um, and a lot of people on board, so um, yeah, a huge challenge. So um, I guess next I'll um, start with the reality check. Like, um, what are the common rules that um, we read in blogs, and um, what, yeah, the evangelists pray, and um, yeah, how did we do it? So the first rule, <laughs> you might have heard of that, or you might know that, or you might even do this, they say, no more Photoshop. Don't use Photoshop anymore, because um, you have a flexible layout. Um, why create a shiny image of what the website is going to look like if it's, looks, if it's going to look different in a browser? And also, why create this um, if you can show really the transitions that are so important in responsive design? So just skip Photoshop. Actually, that first article um, is by, um, was published by 30 Sun Signals uh, in 2008, so when the whole bus um, started. And also, um, Stephen Hay, um, it's a really cool presentation about the, the responsive uh, design workflow. Um, if you haven't watched this, please do, it's really good. And they say, okay, just, just leave it. Yeah, just start straight in the browser, start creating an HTML prototype, and this is all you need. Okay. <laughs> um, our uh, first challenge that we faced was, okay, we're working on a really complex um, website. It's um, a template module system. So how would you specify that in a prototype? If you have like flexible templates and flexible modules, and these are uh, put together differently on the pages. So um, it doesn't really work to, um, to put this in all in, or in one uh, prototype. Um, also, we used the, um, the wireframe uh, phase or the, um, the first de um, design phase also as, an, um, uh, as a gathering of um, detailed requirements because we did the discover phase before, but there we got um, like a broad view on it. But then in each work package, we have to dive into the, the detailed requirements and gather all that. Another challenge that we faced was like, okay, we're seven IAs. <laughs> How can you work on one prototype if you're um, seven people talking to different client stakeholders, working on different work packages? Um, also, that's, um, yeah, kind of hard. Like, how would you do that? Um, so, um, yeah, what, what was left was, okay, we'll create a standard, like a standard IA specification. And the first thought was like, okay, should we do that for all viewports? We have a responsive design, we have a, a laptop viewport, we have um, a smaller viewport for tablets, and even smaller for mobiles. Um, so should we do that for all, um, for all viewports that we have? Um, that was the first pilot that we did during the um, define phase. We said, okay, let's just try it out, how that works. 
Um, let's take one word package, which would be um, the home page, for example, and say, okay, we have a large viewport. This is how our page looks like. Here, we have a medium viewport. Okay, this is how the wireframe could look like for this. And we have a small viewport. Okay, kind of works out fine for the home page, but if you do that for all the, the work packages and all the modules that you have, we would have ended up with a lot, a lot, a lot of pages. <laughs> we still get a lot of pages, but um, it would have been much more. So we said, like, okay, hmm, creating a, um, a standard um, specification for every viewport separately doesn't really work. But you don't want to write a lot of specification. I don't want to write a lot of specification. So um, you want to try to think how you can um, keep this as small as possible. The first thing that we came up with is um, creating a responsive guide, sort of, in our um, design specification setup. And the responsive guide, it holds all the rules and, um, yeah, sort of the basic ground rules for responsive design. So this is one guide that, um, like, one person takes care of, and um, everybody else is working on their specifications, and once you come across a rule which should be a general rule and apply to all modules, you would move this into the responsive guide. So you keep your specification clean of all the, the basic responsive rules and um, keep those separately as your like constitution book. That's um, maybe a smaller thing, but um, it's kind of interesting because I, I like to look at all the different tools that are out there, like OmniGraffel or Axure or um, InDesign or Visio. And um, actually, we found that um, or it's best to work in um, InDesign because actually, I think it's the only tool or the tool that works best when you have a lot of people working on the same specification at the same time because you can just have like a whole bunch of work packages and everybody works in his own work package and in the end you move it all together in one book. And you can have shared modules and um, I think it makes it, for me it was the only tool that really worked there well. Okay, and that's, um, this, it looks really boring but it was basically the most important thing that we had. Um, or a really cool thing that we had is the module list, which <laughs> gives us an overview of all the modules that we have. Um, which was, for, on the one hand, if you have seven people working at the same time, you, you need to have like um, a shared view on, um, on the modules that you already have and the other modules that you still need and what you can reuse. Um, so yeah, keeping this list was, on the one hand, important for having an overview, but also in the end, to get an alignment check, if everything was um, yeah, aligned, if we used the same patterns on everything. So that was a really crucial tool that we, that we used. So that's all in our specification setup. Um, as I said, we had the specification book with all the work packages in it, which contained like, all the module specifications. We had uh, the visual designs then for all, um, yeah, which showed then um, yeah, the exact look of the of the modules. Everything was compiled in the module list, so that was our our guidebook. And then we had the responsive guide, and we also had the personalization guide or the style guide. So all the all the basic rules um, for yeah topics that would allow it moved into the, the basic guidebooks. Can you give an example of a rule? Is it just human language, or what is it? Is it is it more a formal language? The rules. The rules um, for the responsive um, design would be, for example, what would be a rule? Underlines <laughs> always go from right to left. Underlines hmm? go from right to left. And also, we yeah. have a lot of responsive patterns, and I think that's uh, 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 we'll get yes. into that yeah. Uh, later. Uh. Yeah, it's actually that. <laughs> okay. Uh, second rule, what they say. <laughs> Mobile first. <laughs> yeah, start with uh, the small viewport, and then you can move on to the larger viewports. Progressively enhance your website, um, but don't start with the big one and then make it smaller. <laughs> Doesn't work. Okay. Yeah, of course we heard of that. We said, okay, mobile first. Let's let's do it. Uh, um, go for it. 
Um, what then happened was that we talked to our client and uh, noticed that they thought desktop. You know, they, um, they, um, it was, it's very hard if you see a mobile screen first, then to transform it and, and try to picture in your mind how it will look like when it's, when it's bigger. Uh, and another situation that we had at our client was at the moment they were responsible for the web, uh, website themselves. So um, they are actually the people who are taking care of um, it themselves. And they're not used to um, you know, having um, another agency deliver them um, um, screens and mobile screens. <laughs> and they say, why don't you do it in the desktop? Like, I do it in the desktop all the time. We said, OK. <laughs> so they really have the desktop in their minds. And it's very, very hard um, to get them to, um, to mobile. Also, if you think the vision for the website was a flagship store, a really stunning, state-of-the-art flagship store, um, it's kind of hard to show that on a on a mobile screen and really get like this will be the brand experience, especially if you're presenting it to like not your client stakeholders but to senior level uh, management. Then it's really hard to say like, okay, this is our new flagship store. It's this big. Doesn't yeah. <laughs> it's quite a challenge, even though we know it's the right the right thing to you know design mobile first it's hard to use that in in client communication so but we we asked ourselves like how how would you do it if you do it mobile second um, so one thing that we used was um, basically um, creating a, a basic floor plan for um, each site um, just before we started which is actually like a content first approach um, so we said like okay we have in the, in the top area, we have a, a stage highlight, and then we have uh, news information, and then we have other teasers here, and then we have this, and then we have that. And so we get all the elements in the order, and like this floor plan, it wouldn't change for the, for the responsive, or for the smaller um, viewports. So um, this helped us to so first get um, an, a, a clear picture of what do we have on this, on this site, uh, which modules are we using, um, and get this straight first, and then move on to the to the detailed wireframes. So yeah, this is basically a content first approach. And the other thing was what we talked be um, before um, were the responsive patterns. Um, we noticed that when we looked at the at the <coughs> modules, that um, actually when you when you start with a with a desktop screen or a large viewport, and then make the viewport smaller, that there are actually like seven or eight, nine patterns that you would use to make them smaller. For example, you would create a list and the list would still have images. Or um, like a, a teaser carousal would move just into a text list. Or you would have like, if you have a multitude of pictures, maybe you'd have a picture carousal. Um, or expand and collapse and all this. So um, we, we created these responsive patterns and said, okay, we have these patterns that we use. So what we did was um, when we created our specification, um, or when I did it as an uh, information architect, I would say like, okay, this is my module. And um, I built all the, all the elements and design it and say like, okay, if, this, um, if the viewport gets smaller, it would behave like pattern number one. And then the, the um, interactive developers would know, like, okay, it's going to transform into a list. Okay, I know how to do this. So it, it leaves out a lot of, like, really writing down and specification work and just, yeah, use basic pattern. So these were patterns that we would keep in the, um, in the responsive guide, for example. So um, I would say that you can design mobile second. Um, if, uh, on the one hand, you would keep your content structures and um, take a content first approach because that really helps to get like your basic overview of the pages. Um, and if you keep these responsive patterns in mind because they help you to, um, you know, even define the bigger layout, if you think about like how would that behave in a responsive way. And also, we would say like tablet first would work too. Um, even if like mobile first, it does make sense, you know, you do, you do it for a reason, but um, if you have a client that 
things desktop and you would have to start with the, um, with the large viewport first, then um, these are tools that um, might help you. Okay. Uh, rule number three, <laughs> no more waterfall. This is actually not new. Um, we have, I mean, there's a lot of agile approaches out there and especially with um, responsive design, you would say that um, it's, it gets to the core. It's not just like a design that you do, but it's, it gets to the core um, of the problem. You would have designers and um, interaction designers and developers like working so closely together on the, um, on the actual core of the code of the, on the website that um, you can't do it separately in a, in a waterfall approach yet. You'd have to get all of them on, on one table and get them talking to each other and exchange and um, you know do it right in a prototype and <laughs> get your get your developers working on it. So yeah, don't don't just do it in a in a waterfall approach anymore. Um, but we found that I mean still there's a lot of waterfall going on in other projects and especially one thing that we faced um, is I guess pretty common when it comes to bigger um, bigger companies that you would have like separate budgets for for concept and development so you cannot um, just get everybody on, on the table and uh, work together because that's a different pitch <laughs> and um, first we'd have to finish the the concept work and then start with the development work and maybe it's another company <laughs> and maybe it's someone else so um, yeah you you have these separate budgets and this actually doesn't doesn't allow us to, you know, get it all together. Um, but we would have to, you know, keep a waterfall here. But one thing that um, we found uh, helped a lot is if you can make use of connected thinking. Connect, uh, connected thinking is um, a phrase that we quite like it's, uh, at CP Nitro. Um, it means that, yeah, basically you get all the different thoughts uh, on one table and exchange and get the viewpoint of developers and of creatives together to create something new. So yes, um, we um, even though we worked um, officially in a waterfall process, we had um, developers on board actually from the first uh, week on and um, they were working with us during the uh, discover phases and the define phases and um, they were they were there um, for um, basically one of the things that they did was a proof of concept um, because yeah at some point you would have to you know take all the, the patches that you have and put them together and uh, see if it works <laughs> or um, if it doesn't if you have to alter something so yeah proof of concept was the first thing that we ha that we did but um, also I've, I mentioned before that we um, did usability tests. So um, also what they did was um, creating prototypes for this and this actually helped very much because if you put um, together a first HTML click dummy and um, you know to see how it behaves you actually start to feel it and you can see um, how does your navigation work and how would that behave and we use this also not only for usability tests but also for client um, communication so you could you know show the basic behavior and um, basically um, the the developers or yeah we had on on board during the design phase they were like our guardian angels <laughs> and you know checking our concepts and um, yeah constantly basically constantly challenging us so that was good so yeah one thing I can <laughs> totally um, recommend is get them connected get <coughs> creators and tech together like very soon on the project even though if it hasn't like really the, the development track hasn't officially started um, because you have to challenge and to review the, um, the creative concepts. That's another thing, the, the page fold thing, <laughs> that um, is not new either. <laughs> so, um, yeah, a, a former colleague would say, like, page fold, then a Buddha. So, yeah. What, what page fold? There is, with all these different screen resolutions out there, um, 
you have no page hold anymore. <laughs> so, um, but still, um, this was something that we came across in client meetings. Where is the price? Is it above the fold? <laughs> what is this element above the fold? <laughs> and we also have to think about that it's not, I mean, it's not somebody's fault, but that, for example, if you think of um, advertisers, their business models still work like this. Like, is my ad above the fold? Is it visible? So, um, it is something that is still out there. So, um, yeah. <laughs> The fold. <laughs> it's still there. Um, still on responsive design, you would have to have these conversations um, with the clients. And so, yeah, we found that um, what helps is communicating what is responsive design. What does it mean? How many devices do you have? Um, how do they how do they scale? So communicate that from the first minute. <laughs> and um, this is one solution that we didn't really do for the responsive design, but that we did for the personalization, which worked really well. Um, which is, you know, in the beginning you get together with your client um, and set golden rules. So here, the ten commandments for personalization. And do that together with your client, because that will really help you to set up some basic rules. Um, like, what, what does responsive design mean? And one rule could be like, there is no page fold anymore. But if you do that, if you understood that all together, then it helps you during the process because, for example, this poster was in our project room the entire time. And uh, every time someone said, like, okay, let's, uh, why don't we do the personalization like this? You could say, like, no, <laughs> rule number four, <laughs> don't annoy me. <laughs> and you, we all agreed on this, remember? <laughs> so, um, yeah, this, um, uh, this would totally help. So, in the next project, I would maybe do it again for responsive design um, as well. And another thing, it sounds really obvious, um, but use devices for presentation. Um, because if you're showing um, a mobile screen or a, a tablet screen, and if you're showing it on a beamer like this, it's not, I mean, it's further away from you, and you can't really feel like how it, how it behaves and how it look, looks like. Um, another thing that we maybe didn't really see in the beginning, but that we, um, we saw in the client meetings, if you, um, if you, or even that I notice on myself, like if I have a tablet and I have my tablet screen on it, it feels much more emotional. I think these devices, they still have this emotional new um, touch about them that um, you would, um, it's much more enjoyable if you see the screen, right, the way it, um, it will look like in the future and not presented on a wall with Beamer. So, yeah, maybe it's an obvious thing, but um, it was something that really surprised at like, how well it worked if you show it on a device. So, um, basically, as a summary, I can say, like, get hands-on um, with your client. Um, we find it nice to, to think of it as a teamwork, you know, not, you know, getting your work package, presenting it back to the client, um, but, um, you know, work together a lot, spend a lot of time on client side, work on client side, um, and, yeah, get in touch with them, communicate, educate. And actually what we noticed <clears throat> was that it, it got better, <laughs> and our clients really started to, to get the idea and to support the idea, and, yeah, even said, like, no, there's no overlay anymore, we, we have touch, <laughs> you know, and explain that to their colleagues. So um, if you have, like, if you think of you and your client, like, as a, as a large project team, this is really, um, like, a good thing that you can do. So I'm getting to this uh, part, like, what did not work so well? Like, so far I have, you know, like, good solutions for, uh, for the challenges that we had, but some things, um, yeah, you you really not find like the one and only solution for that. Um, but yeah, you can sort of work around that. Um, one thing is, um, yeah, <laughs> on a responsive website, you have like one website for all the viewports. Um, it that's sort of the basic idea of uh, responsive web design, but. One size does not fit all, <laughs> right? Um, for example, um, in our um, 
in our checkout process, in our product um, um, information area, in our product configuration area. Um, when we designed this um, on a large viewport and then um, sort of used our responsive patterns to, um, you know, how to mobilize this and get it all on a mobile screen, we noticed hmm, it does work on a mobile viewport. You can sort of see the elements and they're all, they all look all right, but the user experience is actually not so great and um, yeah, it, it doesn't really fit all. I mean, you can, yeah, it's a mobile site, it's, um, it's well designed, but the entire process, if I, if I would have started on a mobile screen maybe, I would have done it differently. So, um, yeah, <laughs> that's um, really one thing that we that we came across, and um, I think it's um, it's important to see like it doesn't mean responsive layout. It's optimized for all the use cases that you have, and for some aspects we um, we use separate solutions. Right? For example, for the checkout, um, we had to create a separate solution, which requires like more um, more effort from IT side. It's definitely more um, expensive. Um, to do that, therefore, it's um, of course subject again to client discussion. So you have to explain, like, okay, in order to make the user experience better, I would have to build a separate solution, but that's more expensive, and so on and so forth. But yeah, for some for some aspects, it um, it only worked this way. Yeah. And another thing, um, responsive advertising. Um, Actually, when I um, when this uh, presentation was announced, I got an email from um, from a lady from Hamburg. Is she here? <laughs> I don't know. Um, and she said, "Like, I have a question. How did you do the responsive advertising? We're totally struggling on this." And I said, "You picked out the one point that we were really struggling with uh, too, because yeah, <laughs> there is no not yet. There isn't." no solution for, for responsive advertising and um, maybe it's because um, all the, or if you go out to the ad sellers and say like, hey, we're building this responsive website, w what do you offer? <laughs> they said, mobile uh, banner, uh, standard banner, these are the formats that we have, take them and uh, deal with it. And we're like, yeah, but responsive design, have you heard of that? They said, like, yeah, but... <laughs> These are our formats, use them. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's really um, not much solution for that. Um, I, I think in the US there are some, some ad sellers that provide solutions for that, but it didn't help us in our, in our project. So, um, yeah, the ad uh, sellers that we work with, um, they, they don't have it, they don't offer it. Um, so, yeah, what, what we had to do was basically just do um, a query in the beginning, like how big is the viewport, load the um, respective banner, and then once the user starts resizing the window, the, the, the banner won't resize, but at least it will, it will load the, the, the right banner for the viewport. So maybe not an ideal solution, but yeah, kind of a workaround that we, that we used. So yeah. Good solutions for responsive advertising. We don't have them yet. Maybe they'll they'll come in the future. Um, I'm sure they will. <laughs> but it it still takes some time to because it's an, it's a whole system um, to get all the system used to um, responsive design. So I noticed that was really fast, also. <laughs> but good. That leaves us more um, more room for discussion. Um, so yeah, what what have I just said? In a nutshell, um, what did help us was like really think about your specification setup. If you write a large um, specification, um, think about how you want to do this. How many people are working on your team? What's the best tool? Um, what are like documents that you need? How can you keep your documents small? Like maybe there are things that you can move aside to other um, documents. All this. Um, content first works good. Like first, get an idea of what is actually the content on the website before you, before you start thinking of the design. Um, use connected thinking. Um, get your developers um, uh, on board. Get your creatives in one room. Talk about it. Check your concepts. Like, does that work? 
um, and exchange ideas um, how to do it best. And yeah, get, get hands on with your client, um, get into a team, um, educate and explain and communicate, and um, yeah, work on that uh, website all together. So, and in the end, I would say, question the answers. There are um, certain boundaries, but you can push them slowly. As Andrea said before, we just did it, <laughs> right? We, we didn't really know like how, how big it's going to be, but we just tried it. You adapt your process on the way, and yeah, create new things. Because you're going to have the, the same size for desktop pages, I'm guessing, if you, if you do it completely respons uh, responsibly. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, we use this, it's, it's, one, it's one website, but it does resize to the, to the mobile viewport. So, and our client, they said in the beginning, I think they had 10% um, was their traffic from mobile, and that's why a mobile site or a mobile solution was really important to them. So they said, okay, we need this new website, we need this new flagship store, um, but we also really need a mobile solution. And um, because they said, okay, we're, we're tearing it all down, we're starting from scratch, we said, like, this is actually the opportunity where it can... Um, use a responsive approach instead of building separate web pages for... The so you didn't take any other measures to minimize the file size or um, I'd like to give this question to a developer, yeah. actually, because I can't um, um, respond to that in detail. I would guess so, but um, yeah, I think... Because it's still a, a tricky thing that with responsive design that you want to have smaller file sizes for, for mobile, mm. so it's still yeah I mean there's challenge. yeah if I if I think back there's um, there, there was always the, the discussion how would you keep that small um, for example I remember um, when we worked on the social media the social media plugins they're pretty big I guess and they make the website like pretty heavy <laughs> um, and so we said there was yeah something where we also had to get in discussion with the client, say like, hey, do you really want this plugin because it makes the website really slow. And, um, you know, I was talking to the developers, to the clients, and try to decide like, okay, from a user experience point of view, like, how um, do we do it best? But yeah, um, file size and uh, performance is definitely an issue. But I don't have like the solution, like how to do it. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think we worked on that together, like the developers took care of that. like okay these are the responsive patterns guidebook defined move on so they actually we added patterns to them during the process I think we started off with like a basic idea of like three four and then we said like okay does that work and then we started defining the modules and then we noticed ah it does work yeah right for the for the modules that we have okay and then we came across an, a new case and said like maybe we need Maybe we need a separate solution here. So that, that was something that we also started for, for modules that no pattern would fit. We would um, create a separate solution. But sometimes we also noticed, hey, this is not a separate solution. It's actually a new pattern that we use on other, um, on other modules as well. So um, it, was, um, it was a process where we, how we found out the, the responsive patterns. They, they weren't just there. <laughs> but yeah, I found... I wasn't, in the beginning I thought like, hmm, does that really work? Is that really enough? 
because sometimes you would have like really complex interactions. I said like, does that work? Um, but I noticed um, in the end, yeah, it um, for for most modules, it it actually did work. Why did you go with InDesign? I didn't really get every which prototype with InDesign, so it's very strange. Yeah, I mean, after it was clear that we were rock working in that waterfall um, process, and we were you know, first creating wireframes, then creating visual designs, and then um, passing it on to development, then um, we said, okay, what's the, what's the wireframe tool that we could use? And out of the wireframe tools, um, this was um, because of that um, ability that we could work in on different files and um, in the end compile them all into one book. Um, that was the, the one thing that worked best for us. Yeah. Because in other tools, um, for example in OmniGraphle that we use a lot or, or Axure, I know Axure has this functionality where you can sort of work on that together, um, but this um, it didn't really um, it didn't really work for us for for you know seven people working on you know separate separate uh, work packages but then on the same modules again then it was um, it was easier to do it in InDesign. Sorry. The seven people were in the same room or did they work in the same room? We uh, were in the same room. <laughs> Actually, that did help as well. Um, we had uh, people from other locations, but we had them here during the um, project phase. We noticed that you could have um, people in other locations, but um, in the fast pace that we worked in, um, it definitely helped to you know have everybody together. Yeah. Um, what did you what did you um, Yeah, <laughs> they were actually pretty designed. So um, yeah, first because they, um, if they communicate um, like this is how the navigation should look like um, to not only to our project stakeholders but like to a higher level of management, then it definitely helped to have like the the, the finished designs. But um, and also for a usability test, um, it did help us to have like the. The, or a well-designed prototype, um, but it wasn't um, fully functional at all. So that we had very basic use cases um, that we that we designed for that. Yeah. This process quite work without with having down like increasing features, like a different usage environment for mobile and desktop. There is some cut down or some increase on different platforms. Yeah, um, would have been interesting. I think if you if you um, build separate websites, um, if you build a dedicated mobile site or a dedicated tablet site, then um, maybe it makes sense to to cut down on the features. But since we said like it's a, it's one responsive website and it works on all viewports, um, I think we didn't cut down on features. Do you, can you think of something that we left out? Um, no. <laughs> I remember that we uh, often had. Uh, like she said before, we often had to deal with just um, having some extra code on the mobile to actually include, include that one feature because it just doesn't work um, just uh, listing all the elements, but you have um, some extra work to have an extra element that then does that feature. Yeah, there was a question. On the usability testing, um, we did it with a um, with a separate agency, um, and um, yeah, we, we did it on real clients. So we had real um, clients of our clients invited and real um, prospects, so not yet clients, but people interested in the product. And um, yeah, we um, the first test was um, basically just testing two separate design concepts and, and see what do people like better or what works better and um, the second test was basically yeah on the already um, yeah on the on the finished concept and I think we had a third one on the on the product checkout <laughs> yeah so we had three tests. Yeah. 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 Y
Um, no, we just tested. We actually just tested the uh, the, lap the laptop side. Yeah. So the purpose was mainly to um, to convince the client, for example, that um, above or below the fold doesn't matter so much, <laughs> or that uh, a navigation that is not uh, the typical uh, main left navigation or mega drop down uh, that it also you can you know, live with that. So it was mainly to convince. The <laughs> yeah, do you have something to add? Or? Um, I think we had 12 for each test, which is like the standard number if you want to, you know, get a first idea on if something works and then, yeah, it was in the middle of the design process, so that was enough to get a good feedback on what did work and then go back into the process and, and change things. Um, what actually motivated you to go the responsive route rather than just doing a separate mobile version? Sorry? <laughs> what motivated you to go the responsive route rather than just having a separate mobile version? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Um, I think w one thing that really added to the decision was that the client said, let's start from scratch. Because I think it's very hard if you're just changing little things on the website that you would do it responsive. Because then you would have like, I mean, you have to touch really the code and not only, you know, move things around if you want to change something. So, um, yeah, I think it was maybe we were daredevils that we said like, okay, this is maybe the one opportunity that someone says like, okay, um, screw the old website, let's throw it all away start new, build something new, and we said, like, okay, actually, if you're building something entirely new um, today, you'd probably have to think of responsive design, even if now in the end I say, like, okay, I don't know if it's, like, the, the perfect solution. Um, it, it does make some sense um, to build separate mobile solutions and separate tablet solutions, maybe, for, um, for one site, but... Um, if you, if you just think of the, the variety of devices that you have, um, I think um, you would have to some degree think responsive and, and go for a responsive approach. So, yeah. It's very hard to say now in the end, like, why did we do it? <laughs> but, um, but I guess it was, like, um, a big factor was that they said, like, build it new. And then we said, like, okay, if we build it new, it has to be future-proof. Um, we don't want to build another website like in two years, um, so yeah, we think this is the way to go. Yeah. Um, so I think it's uh, becoming easier and easier to justify the responsive design at the moment of selling the product. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> As, um, I mean, not in a way that I can say like, okay, usually if you do a responsive site and you do free uh, website, it's like this times more the effort and this times in the long term, um, I can't give you like um, a, a fixed number. Can um, you guess like roughly? <laughs> Project manager, can you guess? <laughs> you, you can't tell, I mean, it really depends on the website, what you specify, what uh, devices you have. And if you say, okay, we have one website um, and one tablet uh, ready side and then one mobile side, I think this would be three already. Sure. And then I don't think that the difference is too big. Right. If you say you go with uh, one um, desktop version, we have one mobile version as well, you can say it a little bit, but of course uh, the, the device that I support is much lower at the end. But I think it's difficult to have a general number, but uh, if you have like three versions, then it, so it's only slightly higher. I think our challenge was also that um, we had to document a lot, because we had to hand in all the designs, all the specifications for another company to do the, the uh, development. Mm -hmm. 
that is a lot more recommendation effort than if you would do that some some of things. So you have to ensure that in the end, on each viewport and whatever device you open it, um, it'll actually look like we designed it. And so that I think that t is a lot of the extra work and a lot of the documentation mm -hmm. that you wouldn't have if you were to integrate it. And I think what you yeah. also have to take into consideration is uh, the maintenance that you're in. I mean, once you have implemented this uh, responsive website for the customer, it has a very high value, which <coughs> is different to what you have to maintain three websites. Yeah, I think what you just said was very um, true. Um, I think you you would save um, a lot of effort if you would have the team together and you would actually do it like the the ideal approach um, says that you would have no waterfall approach mm -hmm. and just have everybody working together and just quickly create a prototype that works like the the actual site does. Um, that's definitely a lot quicker than um, creating a lot of specifications um, because you would have to hand it to another company. For, for implementation. Yeah. Cal? <coughs> it was, yeah, um, it was basically just on, on the viewport. So we tried to keep that all away from the um, from the client side. Um, or from the from the service side. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, because of performance issues and all that, so we said, okay, we we have just a responsive website. We only work with the, the media queries and then um, you know, deliver the, the correct website. Yeah. How could you document responsiveness? I had no idea. I mean, we have all the mm. different reports, and so, so was it a little bit of small prototype where you could actually see the responsiveness? When you, you could write. Many, many pages yeah. Crazy yeah, definitely you can. Um, I mean, what helped with the responsive patterns? You know, we said like, okay, you would have like um, a, a gallery of um, image text teasers, and, and once this gets smaller, you would turn this into a carousal. Um, and once you have identified these patterns, they take away a lot of the um, the specification work. Um, and also what we did was, in our process, um, we as the, or I'm an information architect, so the information architect said like, okay, this is the, this is the module, this is the responsive patterns that I would like to use. Um, I would specify any exceptions, so if I say like, ah, it doesn't r really work like this, so I would say like, okay, if it, you know, this element has to stay, for example, or this element can be removed entirely. Um, so I would, I would specify all the responsive you know, basic responsive behavior, but actually then the visual designer, they would actually define the exact breakpoints. Um, and they would have, you know, talk more to the developers and say like, okay, how would that, how would that behave? I would do it like this and then create the, um, in fact, then the, the layouts for the different viewports. Um, but yeah, I mean, we notice um, in the end, like, also that if another company is implementing it, of course <laughs> they want the entire description. Um, not because they, probably they know um, how that would behave, or actually if you're showing it, it's, it's much easier. Um, but yeah, if you have another company on board and they, um, there's some discussion on the budget, of course it's easier to say like, this is not specified, <laughs> um, you know. It's not there. <laughs> Do I have to guess? So yeah, um, it leaves a bit um, open. I mean, that's that's like one thing that's maybe also like not solved. Um, you cannot entirely specify or write down the entire behavior. Um, it doesn't make much sense. Um, so you'd have to, you know, get closer to the developers and and have them, you know, also decide, make some decisions. Um, yeah. I can, I can only add to that that the, that the information architects, they're so busy also getting to getting all the requirements from the client and also aligning with the client that this is a solution that we go with in only two feedback cycles. And that the visual design team was actually the one that um, took the input from the information architect and then for each module 
each variant of each module did all the ports. So we have um, all the PSDs and all the, I mean, that's uh, massive, I guess, sitting next to it. <laughs> know that um, it was massive in terms of the, the PNGs and the, um, and the PSDs that we created just for uh, actually each viewport for each module variant um, to, to give you an indication. Not only is more room for terminate as well, and also Still, wouldn't this be easier in HTML? It would, yeah. But, uh, but it, it probably would. We only had the option to have uh, site as partially, um, basically, do a little proof of concepts, because also site don't know when you ask them, does this work in this concept? Oftentimes, they, they've never seen the solution. So then they try it out and say, OK, I come back to you and say, I think this works. This might work better. Here's my idea. Um, and that's how we can work. Do you deal with, uh, I mean, how many different devices did you actually test this on? Um, how did you just use this? I think it's a lot of devices. You mean device monitors at the end? Or, or uh, what yeah. do you mean by testing? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, actually, we... Um, checking if the site works. We haven't developed yet. Yeah, so <laughs> it's... <laughs> <laughs> So it's still it's still in development, um, but it's more than just um, iPhone and iPad. So there are um, there are more devices. There's an entire device matrix that we used. Yeah, the, the device matrix is actually quite small, and, and it was also a recommendation to the, the customer to keep it uh, simple. So um, we have like all the, the recent iOS devices, excluding iPod Mini, um, and plus the, the most common Android devices, which are usually the, the Galaxy. That's also an issue. <laughs> Browser fallbacks. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> and then um, including the you know, eight. Nothing to go. <laughs> yeah. But uh, when you, I mean, you did, the, you did uh, already screen that, so how would you deal with when you use images? How would you do that with the device? Is that the device that you know? 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 Yeah. Can you add something to that? Cause you mean, I don't you mean know like the exact how, how it looks at the end? I mean, we, we had uh, in scope uh, exactly three viewports, right? And that's it. High resolution. If you if you have retina displays, for example. I mean, that is the solution. How the images are provided, right, from the client. So it's not that the, nothing that we had to perform. We 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 basically just gave the client indication what the CMS should uh, provide in terms of image sizes that uh, you don't have the size, the size increase so much for the models. How? Um, I think we had fi we had fixed breakpoints uh, between the different um, viewports, and between that, some um, some scaling. Environment engineering tool. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We created um, a requirements uh, matrix in the beginning, um, so we had like a, a huge sheet with um, with all requirements and um, prioritization, and um, yeah. Then um, actually, when we moved into the um, into the, the detailed design phase, um, we noticed that like, the, the high-level requirements that were created or were collected in the beginning, you need, you need them much more um, refined. But that was done in the beginning of every batch, um, so it was like a really quick process in you know, getting the detailed requirements uh, gathered for one batch, 
and then uh, actually just start with the design like right away. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah, it did happen. <laughs> um, there were huge discussions, um, but well, we had a daily status meeting, and sometimes where things um, came up, you would just say like, "Okay, hey, um, I have this. How would we do this?" And um, yeah, but actually, once um, modules were were finished, so for some work package, if the the process was already finished and it was signed over the client, we said like, "Okay, we don't touch this again," um, because then in the end, you would have to. Um, you know, um, yeah, redo all the all the specifications, and we found like in fact in the in the document before it was you know specified correctly how it should be. So we leave it like this. So if there's another pattern, um, I think in the end we had an alignment check um, where we would um, add the the patterns and check if all the if for example for the same module variations we use the same responsive patterns. So um, that was one thing that we did in the end. That was basically just uh, cleaning up work, um, which yeah, I think you have to have it if you have yeah seven or twelve people working on it. Um, yeah, so basically this was actually done during the alignment um, check to check if everything's um, correctly. But um, during the the process, it was basically just I found this new pattern. Is that uh, okay with everybody? Okay, do, 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 and then. Um, Again, moving again. <laughs> Was okay, actually. <laughs> yeah. The yes. All modules had a module room, and then uh, looked <laughs> what modules could uh, because multiple people were working on it at a very high pace, and so looked where yeah. you can actually align and uh, just combine to more people. I actually expected it to be worse. I think we did pretty well. Um, yeah, but it was there was some cleaning up, and I, I thought like, oh wow, how how should we ever get every, everything aligned? But I think it worked out pretty well without like too much effort. Like usually in a smaller project, you wouldn't have like a cleaning up phase. Um, but after six months, um, there was definitely something that we had to clean. <laughs> The, um, do you mean in general for um, for communication? The cleanup. <laughs> the guide. Oh, the guidebook. Um, actually, the guidebook was um, one of our InDesign documents, so um, that was what we what we just used um, for that. But you could have done it in Word as well. I mean, it's just um, a matter of how how you put it down, and it's basically. Images and text, so um, you can do that in whatever tool um, suits you best. Any specific reason why you can separate it from the style guide? Mm. No, basically, um, the only reason was that um, it was an information architect taking care of it. Um, if it would have been a visual designer, maybe it would have been part of the style guide, um, but we found that um, that was actually the, the uh, first step. That we did because it was one document that um, moved along right um, during the entire process. Yeah, exactly. And in addition, uh, in addition to our style guide, that original style guide was about 200 pages, and uh, yeah, if you split it a bit at least, makes it easier to get information. I think maybe they'd be interested.
it and do it differently, but I don't see as much how <coughs> they could fit it into their organization. Um, especially maybe for, for smaller projects, definitely yes. For a project as big as this one, I wouldn't see how that would work. Because um, of what they say about themselves, that they are actually not able to work with HR. And uh, also other uh, vendors that we met during this project um, claim to say that the experience is that it's better to work with them. So even if everyone knows that it's not the, the ideal working scenario. I think with this, it was mainly because we had, as I said already, over 100 stakeholders, and by changing the website, <coughs> we're changing the organization. Um, people who had never worked, have to work before together, now obviously are, already have a site area together. And they have separate goals, business goals, which don't uh, come together. And so uh, I think the website was a lot of basically changing the relations, change management that we've done. And um, things that came out very late in the project were 